Good morning, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the gorgeous weather, at least here in Philadelphia. It's absolutely beautiful today. I'm here to answer some entrepreneurial questions. And one of the questions I'm always asked about is, I'm looking to raise capital to start my business. Where can I go to get money? Well, there's a variety of different places that you can go, but if you're just starting, of course, in the beginning, if it's at all possible, the least expensive money that you could possibly get is actually bank financing, especially now because the interest rates are so low, but also you don't have to give up any shares in your company. That's really nice. So if you're able to borrow from the bank, that's great. And the SBA loans are at a, a very good rate right now. And the banks feel they can take more risk because 85% of that loan is secure for them by the federal government. There's also a variety of programs if, in fact, you contact your local economic development organization. Every county in the country has an economic development arm. And in those economic development arms, there's a variety of different types of programs. There's also statewide programs, like in Pennsylvania, we have the Ben Franklin Partnership, which gives companies anywhere from $50,000 to a million dollars uh, invest into those companies. So you can get a wide range of money. Of course, with Ben Franklin, just like the name, it's focused on technology companies, but there are a variety of sources out there to support all types of companies. So take a look at these government programs. Then they're angel investors. And just like the name implies, it's for angels, uh, wealthy people who will invest in early stage companies. And the money they typically invest is anywhere from 25,000 to, I've seen as much as a million dollars for an individual investing in a company. And what they're looking for are fast growth scalable business models that they can invest in. So angel investors, they're all over the country. You can go to the uh, Angel Capital Association and find angels in every uh, state. I run one of the largest angel conferences in the world called the Angel Venture Fair. And to go to angelventurefair.com and find out more about that. But in almost every major city in the country, there are angel groups. And in fact, in many secondary uh, cities in the country, there are angel groups. And in every state, there are angel investors. And you can go and find those in investors by just hopping in angel investor and wherever you're located. And we'll tell you the closest location to an angel group that you can submit your idea, your business plan, and for them to take a look at it. And of course, when they're looking at these plans, these angel investors, they're looking for the same things that you see on Shark Tank. In fact, if you watch Shark Tank, you'll understand exactly how this whole thing works, which is they're looking for what problem are you solving with this and what is your solution? And is it easy uh, to execute? And does it have a high barrier? So, which means that not a lot of people could copy what you've done and that you can go and get a nice chunk of the marketplace. So again, I would encourage everybody to watch Shark Tank. I love Shark Tank myself. I find the questions they ask, which is what's the problem you're solving? How much money you need? What is that stock gonna cost the investor to go and buy? And uh, how are you uh, making sales right now? And are the sales growing every month? If you've got sales and they're flat and you're telling me you need money to grow more sales, People are hesitant about that because usually like anything else, word of mouth will help people know about your product or service and it will take off on its own. And what you typically need money uh, for is to increase your marketing spend, but usually to add people on to help take care of all the business that you're getting. I've dealt with three Shark Tank successful companies at raising money and each of them was uh, had a hockey stick and they just needed more money and advice to really blow out their product or idea. And if you can get a good investor that both provides money and expertise and also connections, that's the perfect type of investor. If you go and get an investor who can only provide money, that's the least type of investor that you should be taking on because oftentimes 
They'll be calling you every month wondering how things are going. When am I getting my money back? And they're not adding any more value than their ability to go and write you a check. Then the next level up from that are institutional venture capitalists. And these are people who are investing our pension fund money in companies and they're corporate venture capitalists. So if you had a great idea in the consumer product area, you might contact Johnson and Johnson's venture capital group. Or if you had a good idea in the pharmaceutical area, you would contact GlaxoSmithKline's venture capital group. So, and Intel has had venture capital people Oh, for the last 30, 40 years, they usually make about a hundred investments a year. Dell has its own venture capital group. So you, there's plenty of money out there. If you have a great idea that there's not a lot of people out there trying to do the same thing. And what I mean by a lot of people is if, if there's three to five competitors, no big deal. In fact, you want competitors because with competitors means that other people are educating the market. I can't tell you how many times that I've come up with a great idea, raised the capital and ran out of my capital before the idea took off because I was the first. So I had to educate the marketplace. You don't want to necessarily be the first, but you want to be the first three to five that are offering whatever it is that you're looking to offer in a market that's constantly growing. Just like all the car companies are now following Elon Musk with electric cars. And by the way, there's a ton of money to be made in starting things that support the electric cars. So again, it's a great opportunity to be an entrepreneur today, better now than any time in history, and it's only going to get better. So now let's go to the questions that we get emailed to us. So today, our first question comes from Kathy Lee, and Kathy asked the question, uh, finding the right person, creating the right process to train them. Uh, so her business description is, I've been in the mortgage and real estate industry for 20 years and have built a niche reputation for myself so I don't have a problem generating business. What I need help with are finding the right people to delegate off my plate, creating, creating a workflow system process where certain aspects can be broken off for delegating without sacrificing integrity of file. And the third thing is how to better pass on knowledge that can be passed on through on the job knowledge, tricky credit, income, qualifying scenarios. So let's start with the first thing, finding the right person. What you want to do when you're trying to find the right person is first you want to write out a description of what that job is. Then you want to write out a profile of what uh, expertise, skill sets that person needs to have. Then the third part is you want to run out what exactly are they going to do day to day and what's the expectation of that. And then the last part is creating a training manual to go and show them what they need to do and how to do it. And that might be a combination of writing. It could be video and it could be hands on to go and do that. And take your time hiring the right people and don't try to hire the cheapest person. Hire the person that you think will last the longest with you. And the reason I say that is I once had a client that fired four assistants in one year. And every time they, she said, oh, they weren't really good. They didn't do a great job uh, with the work that they were doing for me. And I said, well, maybe because you're not spending the money to hire the right person. You're not taking your time. You're just looking to fill that position as quickly as possible. And so therefore you're wasting a lot of money because you hire them, you have them working for you for 30, 60 or 90 days, you fire them. You got to go and run that ad online or let everybody know. You've got to look at their resumes. You've got to do the interviewing and then you've got to train that person and then fire them again. So I showed this person by creating a spreadsheet for them that was costing them $40,000 a year for uh, the one person who was their assistant hiring and firing and training and all the other things I just mentioned. So the first thing you want to start out with is making sure you have a good job description of what you're looking for, writing down uh, the right profile from education to skill set, letting everybody know what you're looking for and people especially who know what you're like and how to interact with you and they can uh, get a good picture of what exactly the person's going to be doing 
and knowing you, they're able to go and send you great candidates. I've always been helpful to my uh, friends, my clients, uh, business colleagues in helping them find good people. And I'm not a headhunter, but once they gave me that description, they tell me about that job, it makes it that much easier. Now, once you get in, you can determine what kind of learner are they? Are they somebody who learns from reading? Are they someone who learns from doing? Are they someone who learns visually by watching? So you, when you bring somebody in, find out what their learning style is. And then the rest of the stuff will take care of its on its own. The next question comes from Heather Brockman. And Heather writes, which is better for onboard, onboarding training, a private YouTube channel or a train, I guess a training manual? I'm in the process of redoing my onboarding and want to add training videos for all aspects of my business. I didn't know if a private YouTube channel would be better or something more detailed, such as a training you know, would be better suited for a company wanting to get uh, to franchise level. We offer high-end holistic grooming services for busy pet owners whose animals are part of the family. So I do think having videos is great and you can do those videos, whether it's YouTube or I have to use Vimo and you can set up your own private channel uh, for that. But you also might just have the channel out there and it might attract people who might want to work for you. But again, that's your call because you're afraid that if you show that video to other people, just copy it and go into business uh, against you. But I think anything using YouTube or Vimo and then also written instruction is always good. As I mentioned about the last response I gave um, to the last question, having those written responses, but having hands on and showing somebody what to do. And remember, you usually have to show people three, four different times what to do until they finally pick up and know that they're going to make mistakes and you can't get upset uh, about those mistakes. So I think you both need the writing and the video. And again, you have to be hands-on getting involved with them. Because I think you're thinking about how do we scale that up? Because I personally can't have hands-on, but you're going to train trainers who are training the trainers. That's what they call it. So I would definitely suggest that you do all three of those things. And over time, uh, you'll scale up. But the videos are great to have because people can keep watching them over and over again. How many of us have fixed things around our house by just watching a video on YouTube? I mean, people have actually looked at uh, videos and put splints on and put broken bones, everything until they're able to actually get to a doctor. So the videos are very successful. The next question comes from Gabor uh, Race. Gabor asked, what are some quick wins I can implement to increase our bottom line profitability, and how should I go about doing this in the long term? Throughout the past two years, I've been focused on growing our top line revenue, and this year we're on a track to hit $1 million in sales. Congratulations. We've been profitable all the way, but I feel there's probably a lot of, uh, a lot of waste we could eliminate. Normally, I'm the sales guy, not the savings guy, so I'm not sure how to get started as well as how to make constant awareness of our bottom line as an integral part of how we do business. We currently have a full-time accountant who can get uh, me any reports I need. Okay, I've been through this many times with many companies. <clears throat> and the best thing that you can do is take a spreadsheet and actually dissect every single expense and, and get it to a granular point. So I'll give you an example. I was running a magazine company and we were trying to figure out how do we reduce our costs because we were losing money. And so I found that the shine on the magazine was costing 100000 a year. Now, the past CEO of the magazine never even went to the publishing house to publish the magazines and said to him, what's the best way for us to reduce our costs? And so when I asked that question, he said, well, if you took the shine off the magazine, that would save you 100000 If you went to a lower poundage, that would save you money. By the time I left that room after a couple hour discussion, I saved $300,000. Now, as I was taking apart the financials, I found out that we were spending over 5,000 in magazine subscriptions for 30 people. That's a lot of money in subscriptions. So then I took that apart and realized that 
some of the people were ordering two magazines, one for home and one for the office. So there was another savings for it. You can go and go line by line in your financials and go and say, oh, this insurance cost, where could we get the same quality of insurance for a lesser price? You might go to an insurance broker and say, can we beat this current price out there? So again, if you start taking a look at everything that you're doing, you can find out we're a member of this organization, but we never go to any events. We can cut that out. We're a sponsor of an event at a chamber of commerce, but we don't get a spreadsheet of attendees and their contact information. Geez, we're just better off going ourselves and networking the event. We'll cut that out. So there are always things that you can reduce, but you don't want to reduce muscle, which means if you've got great people, you don't want to get rid of them and you don't want to cut their salaries. You want to give them incentive. The other thing I uh, would do if I were you, and it's worked well for me, is I open up the entire books to our uh, employees. I don't tell them who is making what, but they get to see all the other expenses. And I ask them, take a look at these expenses and tell me anywhere that I can cut. And any cut you find that we implement, you're going to get 10% of the savings. Let me tell you, people pour through everything looking for that because they figure there's always waste in fact they know that they're part of the waste they know that they don't do certain things that could save the company money so now they bring it to you and say hey if i do this we do this we can lower the cost of what we're doing and that will save us x amount of dollars you don't care what it is you don't care how small it is because once people get the taste of that they'll keep working on trying to reduce cost so our last question is from Robin Turpin. Robin asks, time management. What time management system or process do you use and why? I want to be as productive as I can be, and I know there is software and good old fashioned day planners. What are you using today to stay efficient and manage your time? Thank you so much. I don't use anybody's particular system. I am somebody who's very disciplined and I like to use spreadsheets for everything. Even my, uh, I don't use any type of accounting software package. I create my own on a spreadsheet. From a, from a time management standpoint, you should go and figure out what is the best time for you to work with your clients or contact clients, which I like to do when I'm going to send out emails in the morning, uh, when I'm going to send out emails uh, to potential clients, I like those emails to go out at 8.30 in the morning when people are just settling in, they've got their cup of coffee or iced tea or hot chocolate, and they're sitting there reading their emails. I don't like to set anything out after 9 a.m. And then I start working on the next day's emails starting around 5 p.m. During the morning, I actually call potential clients or clients with follow-up calls in the morning. In the afternoon, I do my work. So think about what works best for your business, because obviously, if you're a dry cleaner, well, you're there and the only thing you're probably thinking about is marketing and how do you go and get more people to come to the dry cleaner, but the machines do all the work. All you're doing at the counter is taking the clothing in and then sending it off to the people uh, behind the scenes doing it. If in fact you're a lawyer out there, you're actually doing the work day to day. So the only way for you to go get more business is if you set breakfast and lunches or attend luncheons or breakfast or dinners so you can network with people. But during the rest of the day, you're busy working on your client stuff. So you have to customize it to what you're doing. And you should create a spreadsheet and say, where is the time I'm most effective? And me, I like working Sundays. I work every single Sunday. Why? Because nobody's calling me on Sunday. And I get the, I feel like, oh my God, I've gotten so much done. Uh, today and I start getting stuff done for Monday, Tuesday. Now, when the weather turns gorgeous, like uh, as we're going into, as we're in spring and summer, I typically will work half the days on Sundays. If it's a rainy day, I will work the whole day, but otherwise I'll do that. So again, put a plan together that works for you. And also don't forget about yourself and your family. You have to factor that in. The one thing I always used to do is I would get up at five in the morning, work out, eat breakfast at six, and make sure I was home for dinner so I could see my girls every day 
at 6.30 for dinner. We'd eat dinner from 6.30 to 7. I would play for, with them from 7 to 8, watch TV with them, read them a book, and then I might read for another hour or do things before I went to bed. Of course, talk to my wife uh, and put all those things in place. On Saturdays, I always made sure I had a clear day and would take my kids to do things from 10 to 2, just me and them. And then we would get together with my wife and, and go forward with the rest of the day. So make sure, because life goes incredibly fast. I can't believe myself. I just turned 60. My girls are 30 and 27. Where did the time go? And you don't want to think to yourself, my gosh, I spent all this time working, never enjoying life. So you have to find somewhat of a work-life balance. But if you're looking for 40 hours a week, that's pretty hard to do as an entrepreneur. But if you're thinking 50 to 60 hours a week, you probably can get a lot done and be successful uh, doing that. But again, figure out what works best for your type of business. Well, I enjoyed speaking to all of you. I hope all of you have a great rest of your day and a great weekend. Hope you're all successful. And I look forward to your next set of questions. Have a great day. Thank you so much for listening.